Well, it's good to see everyone this morning. Thank you for choosing to worship with us here at Liberty Baptist Church. Let's all stand to our feet, and we're going to pray together, and then we'll just get right into the singing. I'm just warming up those quad muscles for you there, just getting, getting you ready, getting you ready to sing like our wonderful choir did this morning. So let's look to the Lord and pray together. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your amazing truth that you've revealed to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and preserved for us in your scriptures. And Lord, we thank you that we can gather in your name and be, and be in your house among these wonderful people that you've saved. And Father, I pray that as we gather for worship to get today, that our hearts will be lifted up to you, not in pride, but in humility. We ask you to pour out your grace into us that we may know your word and follow your will and that we can worship you in spirit and in truth and glorify you as you so richly deserve, because, Lord, you alone are worthy. So receive our worship and as we praise your majestic name and thank you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Remain standing as Brother Barry comes to lead us. 246, 246, redeem. 246. I hope you're listening to the choruses, the it's actually psalms and verses, scriptural verses that the choir is singing. We're using that as a method also to teach you. But the only way you're going to learn is to take them and just go home, maybe in your shower or wherever, and just try to bang them out. And then as we do them two or three times, they'll come together. You'll have them with you the rest of your life. Unless you get some kind of brain thing or something. But you can use them. They're a blessing. 246 redeemed. Let's sing. Redeem thou I love her, proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, redeem, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeem, redeem. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. 
seated. Our reading from the scriptures today comes from Psalm 15. Psalm 15. You're welcome to turn there. Um, I will read aloud this entire psalm of five verses. Some of you have stopped chuckling at this point. I'll have to find a new joke. Psalm 15. I'll read aloud as you follow along. The Bible says, Here, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? who shall dwell in thy holy hill. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. What the psalmist David here is doing is not so much giving us a to-do list or uh, uh, boxes to check as though that these are the all-inclusive or even rudimentary list of things that a saved person could do or should do. Now, no doubt, if we're believers, this is a good place to look to see how someone would behave. But behavior comes from belief. Behavior does not change your beliefs. Who you are in your heart, whether or not you fear the Lord, starts from within. Long before your ethics are ever revealed, your belief has to be solidified within your heart. David, if we were to say in a New Testament way, is taking James's approach to righteousness. See, if we take Paul's approach, we understand that it's by grace that we're saved through faith. And certainly not that of ourselves. It is and always has been the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But James takes a perspective that says, if you have faith, show me. As though James were from Missouri, right? The show me state. He wants us to see what righteousness looks like in the most relevant, practical way. In fact, it's the only way that we can tell that anybody is saved. We can't see their heart, but we can see their hands, how they walk with the Lord, how they do things that would demonstrate righteousness. And David asks, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? That is the tabernacle of the Lord. Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Only those who have been transformed inwardly. See, all this list shows us is the exact opposite of who we are naturally found to be. We don't like to walk uprightly. We like to walk selfishly. We do those things which will please and benefit ourselves first and foremost. We don't like to speak truth in our heart. We like to think of ways that we can deceive others into fulfilling our own will. We don't work righteousness unless it gets us a leg up on someone else. And the list goes on and on and on. Who are you? That's really the question David is asking. And who are you before God? If you're merely a decent and upright and appearing person, is that enough to appear before God, to dwell forever in his holy hill, to worship in his eternal temple? Is that all it takes? Mere appearances? Is there something more forensic, more intrinsic, something deep within that must be transformed? 
Now we know the answer, perhaps, but not everyone does. We're called upon, not just by David, but as we'll see in our text later today, to ask ourselves, who are we before God? And are we that right, transformed person, the person who's been transformed by his grace? So as we bow in prayer together in this moment, let's allow God the free reign to probe our heart and ask the tough question and rightfully demand an answer. Who are we before him? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to know you. And Lord, I pray that as we open up our heart to your truth, that we would, as the psalmist said, speak truth in our heart. Lord, speak truth to our heart. Help us to know it. Allow us to experience the reproof that is necessary from your word. Help us to see your goodness and righteousness and to flock to it. And Father, I pray that as we examine your words today, that first we would open our hearts to your spirit's examination, that we would be the person that you want us to be, someone redeemed and transformed to demonstrate your glory in this world. Father, bless us with such grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a moment and enjoy this special from our choir. Underneath the cloudless sky, 
Blessed be the name. 159. You find your place. Let's stand as we sing. 159. Blessed be the name. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme. Who gave his son for man to die that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. The Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. Had God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, what's ruined by the fall? Thou thy salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace, of all earth's kingdoms conquer, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. You need another? <laughs> All right, at this time, we'll go ahead and release our children for Junior Church as the rest of us turn to Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew 19, we're going to read verses 13 through 30, verses 19 through 30 today. Well, the kids are excited. Man, I'm going to go preach in junior church today. Look at that, man. They're just pumped. So what a great spirit there is here today. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll send them home sugared up just for you, parents. We're looking out for you. All right, Matthew chapter number 19. And as I said, we'll begin reading verse number 13. Where the Bible says here, then were there brought unto him, that's Jesus, little children, that he should put his hand on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer, <clears throat> excuse me, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily, I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all, and followed thee, and what shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye, shall also, ye also shall sit up, uh, excuse me, upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. My message this morning is entitled, The Impossibility of Salvation. The Impossibility of Salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for mercy. And we thank you, Lord, that through Jesus Christ, we can know what salvation is. Help us to understand your scripture. Lord, I pray that you'll give us understanding and wisdom as we offer this sermon as an act of worship to you and our response to it as well. And God, may you be glorified as we examine this text. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Have you ever gotten stuck in something? We can get stuck in something and because we often think we can weasel our way into some tight places. I've seen cars, especially this last week in Florida, darting in and out of traffic in tight places that now, having been many years removed from that type of activity, makes me extremely nervous. Doesn't seem to make them nervous at all, <laughs> which makes me even more nervous that they're not nervous about squeezing into very tight places going 80 miles an hour down the road. They're narrowly avoiding these pitfalls and the cars around them, and yet somehow they make it safely most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes we don't always quite squeeze into something and then squeeze out of it quite so, quite so deftly, do we? In fact, I was looking at a story that I found this week, and it was a little dated from last year. Last September, the police department in Boulder, Colorado, responded to a frantic phone call from a mother whose child had their head stuck in between those wrought iron bars out on the porch. And she was stuck, and the child was, was needing help and was desperate for help. And in fact, that's how the whole situation unraveled. The little girl thought that she could just stick her head right through there to play a game. And uh, she could. The problem was... She couldn't get unstuck, and she had some decisions to make. She could just lay there and flop around and uh, wait, but she did the smart thing. She called out for help. Mama came running, as mama bears like to do, and they called the police. Now, one of the interesting things about this story is that they needed a battering ram to free the child. Now, before you get an image in your mind how that battering ram was employed, okay? They used it as a heavy crowbar to pry the bars far enough apart, okay? Some of you need to, need to pray about some things, okay? They used it to pry the bars far enough apart in order to free the child, and, and she ran to her mother and got a big hug, and she even got a sticker from the police, okay? Because what well, little girl wouldn't want a sticker after being liberated from the bars that she was in? Now, she was freed 
thanks to calling out for help and believing that those folks would be able to help. And in today's passage, we also have a story of a man whose big head was getting him stuck into places, metaphorically speaking. And this man you may know by several descriptions. In fact, if we were to take the descriptions from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we would know that this young man, he's young, according to Matthew's description. He's rich, according to Mark's description. And he's a ruler, according to Luke's description. That would make him the rich, young ruler that you're probably familiar with. Now, his head was just too big to fit through the impossibly small and narrow path to the kingdom of heaven. It's like he was a giraffe or or an elephant or, as Jesus would say, a camel. Yes, a camel trying to squeeze his way through this tiny sewing needle. And we'll see. Of course, we know Jesus likes to use hyperbole and exaggeration, (laughs) leaving us preachers a great example. But we're going to see what this man's question is all about and why it is that he's struggling so much to really get into the kingdom of heaven. Now, from the start of this story, we can see that this camel doesn't look too big. In fact, it doesn't look too tall or too hefty or too wide. This camel, so to speak, is somewhat commendable for his smallness, it would appear. As we look in the text, we see he's actually done some right things and lived a pretty decent way in life. If we go back to the text here in just a moment, we'll see this rich young ruler is to be commended for coming to the right person to ask his question. He came to Jesus. In fact, in Mark's version of this story, this man would run up and kneel before Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. And he's to be commended because he's going to ask the right question. Well, we'll see it's half right. There's some issues that we'll dig out. But here in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, we see that this man comes and he's asking the question. We'll read it again. And behold, one came and said unto him, good master, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he comes to Jesus and he asks a good question. Now, despite its obvious flaws, which we'll get to in just a moment, he displays the fear of God. He recognizes Jesus's authority and he has a genuine concern for his own soul. He seems to believe very thoroughly about life after death. He wants to know more about it. He wants to know more about how and what's going to happen to him after eternal life. What is going to happen? How do I get eternal life? Now, I think if we were honest, most of us don't really think this way. We think very little about life after death. It's just not simply an everyday preoccupation. It really is something that makes us restless, It makes us worry. Have you ever noticed, to be blunt, at funerals, people are moving on to new conversations as soon as possible. They're going to talk about themselves, their lives, their plans for next week, all the while forgetting the opaque reality staring them in the face. Why? It's extremely uncomfortable to think about that and what that means for you. But this man appears to be genuinely concerned. His biggest concerns in life don't revolve around missing out on the benefits of life. He's he's asking probative questions. He really wants to know, not just about earthbound things, but about eternal things. He's genuinely concerned about life after death, not, not just simply some superficiality about life. So this man's question, though, though we'll see, it's a, it's a little off. He is actually asking the essential question for life. How can I have eternal life? He wants to know. Now, his question is a good question, but it's not a perfect question. It's, it's imperfections are really found right in the middle. He asks, what good thing, or we could say, what good deed must I do? What must I do? Now, the words good thing or good deed and do are problematic for us because it's those words that imply a, a piety of achievements that, that, sa- that really stands in direct contrast to Jesus's teaching. Not just all of it, but specifically the ones that he's been addressing in the Gospel of Mark with the same passage, the same story, where he's telling people to receive 
the kingdom of God like a little child. And here in our passage, Matthew chapter 19 and verses 13 through 15, he's modeling what that reception as a little child actually looks like. He wants the little children to come to him and they're brought to him for a blessing. Children and people that demonstrate childlike faith are the ones that get access to Jesus Christ, that receive the hands-on blessing from Jesus himself. Now, here comes the challenge. And instead of coming to Jesus helpless and dependent as a small child would, this rich young ruler comes as a man, as a rich man, as an able man, as a good man. That's not the way anyone can come to Jesus. Now, Jesus, thank the Lord, will attempt to show him as commendable as this man may be, he's going to attempt to show him that he is far too big, far too big to get into the kingdom of heaven by coming to Jesus that way. This is why Jesus says in essence to him, look, I see by your very question that I need to make something smaller. Your head is just a little too big. If, if you try to go through like that, you're just going to get stuck. You'll never, ever make it. Now, Matthew, be more sophisticated than I myself, records it like this in the first part of verse number 17. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. Now with the first half of this response, Jesus is basically asking him, who really is good? And Jesus will go on to remind him, there is none good except one. And who is that one? God alone. God is the only one who is good. And, and here, Jesus, of course, is not denying his deity or his own goodness, but instead, he's trying to spotlight the unique goodness of God in the hope, catch this, in the hope that this man will recognize that the only way to obtain eternal life is to be utterly reliant, not on your sinful self, but upon the good and gracious God, who alone is good. So it follows then after, that as we continue in verse number 17, that Jesus is going to remind him that God alone is good. And as he continues through that verse and then through, verse, uh, through verses 18 and 19, he's specifically going to test this man's so-called goodness by means of showing him God's good law. In essence, our Lord is going to ask him, are you good? Really? Are you, are you good? So we'll pick up there in verse number 17. If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. It's pretty straightforward. He saith unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother and Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, Jesus, for what it's worth, doesn't give any new insight. There's new, no new commandments, nothing revolutionary here. You've heard it said of old time, and there's nothing new to add. This is it. He takes this Jewish man back to the very heart of the Jewish religion. The Ten Commandments, which you can find in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. And he also specifically quotes Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, which, oh, by the way, is the most frequently quoted verse of the Old Testament in the New Testament. So Christ is understanding something that he wants us to understand as we go through this conversation, that if we feed people the heart of the law, both the internal ethics and the external ethics of it, we should quickly learn just how bad we are in the sight of a truly good God. We should all thoroughly come to the conclusion that we cannot keep even the most simple, basic, far-reaching commandments of God. We can't do it. And if that's the law of a good God, then we have to conclude we are in no way, shape, or form good by any definition. We have to learn, just as Paul taught in Romans and in Galatians, that through the knowledge of the law comes the knowledge of sin. When we see the God's good law for what it is, we see how not good we are. Now, like a sword, Jesus is going to pick up the Ten Commandments and he's going to sever the plastic armor 
that this man adorns him with that he would call his own goodness. And he's going to slice away this man's robe of self-righteousness in order to expose the reality of his not good heart. The sword, uh, the, the word of God is indeed a sword that Jesus is wielding. Now, it's how our Lord strikes him and wounds him, so to speak, with the word that really is fascinating. Let's take a look at this. We'll read verses 18 and 19 again here in our text where Jesus, now the first person to speak is this rich young ruler. He saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, did you notice what Jesus did here? The interesting thing that he does with the Ten Commandments? He omits some things. First of all, he omits the first four commandments. Now, if we ever had that written out, uh, the way that Moses had it written out, that would be the first table. There's two tables that Moses came down with twice because there was an issue. He comes down twice. The first four are on the first tablet of that Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And Jesus skips over them entirely. Now, we'll get back to that. But he's going to press the point. And he's going to skip these first four about God in order to quote from the second table all of those last ones that are basically summarized from Leviticus 19, 18, and here at the end of verse 19, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You want to love your neighbor. Why would he skip the first four? Because he's emphasizing loving your neighbor. So he's taking that second table of the Ten Commandments and holding it up as a full-length mirror in front of this rich young ruler. And he's saying, I want you to look into this mirror and tell me, if you really love your neighbor, because that's what all of these commands are going to focus on. He's saying, how, how do you look? Are you, are you really good? Have you defrauded anyone? Have you taken anyone's fortune? Ha, ha, have you done something against your neighbor? I mean, have you, have you taken riches? How have you made your riches? By exploiting the poor? Have you been generous and compassionate? Have you been a rich man? With your wealth, that is, by giving away those things which are important to you? Have you been a young man with vigor, yielding your strength to the Lord? Have you been a rich ruler in your judgments? Or have you been plain favorites? Have you been able to receive a bribe? Have you truly loved your neighbor as much as you love yourself? I wonder how any of us would fare if Jesus came to us in our positions, in our employment, and asked us how we've used our positions to glorify him. Now, the first intentional and really ingenious omission is that the first four commandments were skipped. And he's going on to elucidate the, 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 the challenges that this young man faces by exposing how he loves his neighbor. Now, what's also interesting to me is that there's another omission, and that is the last commandment, commandment number 10. Now, he's skipping this to come back to it. And that 10th commandment is, thou shalt not covet. He doesn't want other people, he doesn't want us desiring other people's possessions. And so you would think that all the commandments that Jesus would have signed for the rich man, he wouldn't have skipped this one just to come back to it. But he's setting him up to think a little bit more introspectively, to divinely reveal what's really taking place in this man's heart. See, the rest of Christ's response deals with the, with the Tenth Commandment. He's going to focus exclusively on this one, because this particular man's vice is his moral defect, as divinely detected by Jesus, of course, is his failure to adhere to the Tenth Commandment. This man is filled with the disease of coveting. And so this man declares his own innocence. All of these things have I kept from my youth up. What do I lack? Is there anything missing? Now, Jesus lovingly applies a very painful remedy. Jesus is going to ask him in effect in verse number 20. Have you really kept all the commandments? 
Let's read this again. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. If you want to be perfect, that is perfect in the sense of keeping both tables of the law, then you must do something. And that something is this. Love others, especially the poor, the widows, the orphans, the blind beggars, and follow. That is, love me first. The rich man knew. He knew he was lacking something. That's why he asked Jesus what it was. What am I lacking? What is going on? This is not an arrogant man trying to taunt his way into salvation. He's asking genuine questions. Not perfect questions, but genuine questions. He's lacking something. He just isn't sure what that is. And if he's lacking something, he says, I must be able to add something to my life. If I'm lacking something, then I can just plus up on something and I can add it to it. But Jesus, intending to direct this man to the childlike dependence that he needs, says, actually, it's not adding something to your life. It's subtracting. I need to get you to a point where you're depending only on God. Our Lord is seeking to bring this man to such a point of dependence that he's challenging him to cut off all of his riches. Sell everything that you have. Everything that you possess, get rid of it. Give it to the poor. And challenge the rich young ruler to cut off his self-rule. When Jesus said, come and follow me. Don't follow yourself, your whims, your ambitions, your dreams, your goals, your self-centered perspectives. Come and follow me. Make me the ruler of your life. Depend fully on me. Then you'll be a disciple. Then you'll have eternal life. He doesn't demand, Jesus that is, doesn't demand almsgiving, meaning, well, you can give a little bit away and... And, and that'll be okay. He, he demands everything, everything. Give everything to others and then give everything to me. He demands everything. Think about it like this. What are the two great commandments? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. What is he doing? He's saying, give everything to others. Love your neighbor. Give everything to Jesus Christ. Love God. He's drawing him in to yearn to know God and to love him and to experience his grace. But such a challenge is too hard. It's impossible. It's impossibly difficult. The arrow of Christ's command struck this man right in his Achilles heel. The weight of the 10th commandment crushed him. And just one commandment. This man, who only moments ago came and knelt before Jesus Christ with great expectation, now stood up and turned his back. Why? Let's read verse number 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Why did he go away? There's only one reason that's given. He had great possessions. Or we might rightly say, because great possessions had him. At the very core of this man, who led an exemplary but idolatrous life, lay the sin of coveting. His possessions had his head in a vice. And he saw no reason to get unstuck. He sincerely loved things more than he loved God more than he desired eternal life. Money was the highest God that he had. We see this in what's called the parable of the sower, or the parable of the soils. We see this re uh, work right before of us because in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 22, Jesus warns of the deceitfulness of riches. And this deceit grows like a thousand thorns, thorns moving up and all around him, strangling this man to death because he would rather be strangled by money than liberated to love Jesus Christ. 
Now, allow me to tell you a story within a story to help us understand this, <laughs> this danger of riches. In the book entitled Teaching a Stone to Talk, uh, Annie Dillard recalls the tragic story of the Franklin Expedition, which some of you who may be students of history will know that's the British exposition, uh, expedition to search out the North Pole. And in 1845, this group of English explorers died. No more foreshadowing. Really, because they were ill-prepared for the challenges. Now, I would go so far to say they were not ill-prepared. They were ill-advised. That is, self-advised. Because instead of making more room on their ships for the coal to power their steam-powered engines, they decided to live a little lavishly while they were out on their expedition. They decided to live it up a little bit, and back then that looked like massive libraries, extra places for fun and games, and lavish table settings, and, and everything that the pomp life could give them. After all, I mean, they were daring to cross out and strike out across this great expedition, and they will become heroes, and legend would record their name in history. Why not have a wonderful time of music and, and an organ to be set up and fancy teacups and, and musical instruments galore to celebrate their amazing soon-to-be accomplishment? Well, as you can imagine, it is the Arctic. And it's really, really cold up there. You thought you were cold. And not only were they finding themselves freezing, but they were running out of coal to power the very vessels that they were on. And before you know it, there go the musical instruments into the fire. There goes the lavish materials. There go the books and the library. There goes everything. But how did we find them? Frozen to death. When another expedition went out, find them and actually did discover them, they found them all frozen. And one thing that they did interestingly find is that there was one man, a skeleton, uh, with the passing of time, who was adorned in a fine blue cloth uniform, edged with silk braids, and he was sadly grasping sterling silver flatware. He was holding onto his most prized possessions rather than trying to save him. By the way, 128 people died. What an illustration of the love of pomp and lavishness that would keep them from salvation, if you will. This rich young ruler in Matthew acted just as foolishly as these dead British explorers. But instead of trying to carry sterling silver through the frozen Arctic, this man, this rich young ruler, was trying to carry all of his possessions through the tiny entrance into the kingdom of God. And just as those explorers had to, had to do what they could to make their ships, uh, they, they, excuse me, they failed to do what they could to make their ships hold more coal and fewer luxuries, this man was not willing to unhinge himself from the huge weight off of his back of all the shackles of his possessions. And, in, and instead of walking as a small man, as a poor man, as a humble man, as a childlike man, he walked in pomp and arrogance. Jesus was calling him to faith, to walk in uprightness, but in a small and narrow way. But I will say, as Jesus said, it's easier said than done. Jesus knew that. This is why, if you look again at our passage in verses 23 and 24, you'll see that he turns to his disciples and says this, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, and if you were to read the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that he starts off by calling them children, a key term in our theology here. Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now Mark Twain once said this, It ain't those parts of the Bible that I can understand that bother me, or that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand that bother me. And I think Jesus, as he speaks in verses 23 and 24, is, those words are very understandable. 
they're also very bothersome because we are very tempted to shirk off this bothersome uh, commandment. We will take his clear words and try to blur them, try to convince ourselves that in some way, shape, or form, these words only apply to this man in this context, in this history, at this appropriate setting, and it doesn't apply to modern disciples who are trying to whittle away at holding on tightly to unnecessary things in this life. We tend to create this imaginary red line, this this danger line that we can be just so rich or just so lavish. And as long as we don't cross that imaginary line, then, then we're doing okay. Because we can, after all, always imagine someone that has a little bit better of life than us, a little bit more pomp of a lifestyle, that has a little bit more in their savings account or makes a little bit more money in their salary. We would say, well, this guy is rich, but, but I'm, I'm not rich. It's tempting to take Christ's words and, and apply them to anyone but us. But to do so would be wrong Furthermore, it would be unwise. We well-to-do Americans can indeed take comfort in the fact that Jesus does not categorically condemn wealth. In fact, the Lord never commanded every rich person he encountered to sell all of his possessions, even though he tells this one man here. In fact, this is the only incident where we have such a command to such a person. However... Based on the fact that Jesus in the gospel has nothing positive to say about money and he never speaks of wealth as a blessing, he repeatedly uses illustrations that the abundance of possessions are actually toxic to the soul. It's fair to say that wealth in and of itself can be and often is a great barrier or roadblock on the path to paradise. In other words, nothing fattens the camel like an abundance of worldly goods. How many fat camels do we have in here today? Now, one of the great surprises of the text, certainly one that has tested my thinking and our thinking, that he's, Jesus is pushing this man not to covet the world's goods, but to covet the kingdom more than he covets cash. He turns to his disciples he doesn't say anything about coveting. Not one thing. He really only says, it's really with great difficulty that rich people are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, to paraphrase verse number 23. I expected him to say something more along the, along the lines of how difficult it will be for those who covet or hoard or love riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. But that's not what he said. Our Lord recognizes the inherent danger of having much money. We tend to think of the rich as privileged people, but Jesus consistently saw them as underprivileged because of the barrier it creates to the kingdom of God. The people in his day, as we'll see with Peter's genuine response, they saw riches as a manifest sign of God's blessing. But Jesus saw wealth as a hindrance to spiritual progress. And and here's here's why. Here's why. In Jesus' estimation, wealth naturally creates all that makes people too big, too fat, and too adult. Wealth often deadens our instinct for self-sacrifice. Why? We can buy our ways to comfort. Wealth often fosters an ungodly notion that this world has much to offer. Wealth often numbs our minds to the reality of the joys of heaven and the torments of hell. Why? Because we're enjoying the best comforts that this world has to offer by just shelling out a few more bucks. There's always something more on earth to buy and something more on earth to look forward to when you have wealth. Wealth lures us oftentimes into believing that everything can be bought if the price is right. In most cases, wealth comes with a heavy dose of self-indulgence, self-reliance, self-importance, and self-security. Wealth gives you status that, frankly, poor people just don't have. It's hard to see all those poor people from such a lofty view as I look down my nose at them. Wealth has a way of ruling our life, ruling our time, 
ruling our vocations, ruling our commitments, and ultimately ruling every one of our concerns. It's this whole point of Jesus' hyperbole about the camel and the eye of the needle that he's trying to make this emphatic truth be known in our hearts, that those who are ruled by money cannot be ruled by God. You have your God. You will serve God or you will serve mammon, money. There's no in-between. And now, while it is true, and it's not to be forgotten, that it is not so much having money that is wrong, it's the trusting in it that ruins our soul. It is likewise true that it is easier to trust in money when we have money. What Christ is requiring of us in his gospel is childlike faith in the Heavenly Father, dependence on him, not on our bank statements. The gospel still demands poverty of spirit in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, which, according to Jesus, goes hand in hand with poverty of possessions. We need to change our standard of living from one of material goods to spiritual fulfillment. We should have a standard of spiritual living, not material living. Now, as I often run the risk, if you are a bit offended or perplexed or aghast, don't worry, you're not alone. As an American myself, we all have to ask the question, if, he, if Jesus turned to the disciples and said this to them, what must our response be to Jesus as we look at this very difficult and seemingly impossible reality? Because when the disciples heard this in verse number 25, they had an understandable response. They were greatly astonished, wondering who can be saved. The text tells us when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? Who can be saved? Now our Lord is looking... And he's saying, can this good man and rich man, who seems good on the outside, really enter the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, no. <laughs> it's, it seems to be impossible. Someone, Wait, you're telling me someone that's been faithful to the law and quote-unquote obviously blessed is not going to enter the kingdom of heaven? Now, if that's true, Jesus, then who in the world even has a chance of getting in. Now, Jesus actually likes what's happening here. Finally, finally, the disciples are asking the right question. Here in verse number 26, Jesus confirms their thinking by basically saying, yeah, that's, that's right. No one qualifies. Verse 26 says, but Jesus beheld them. That means he looked at them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. No one gets in. As far as man's concerned, Jesus beholds them. He says, with men, this, that is salvation, the salvation you're talking about, this eternal life that this rich young ruler wanted, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So here, Jesus answers them in these absolute terms in order to impress upon them this understanding that salvation from start to finish is not about human achievement at all. The great will not be let into the kingdom simply because they're great. The good won't be let in simply because they're good. The rich don't get in the kingdom simply because they're rich. Salvation is impossible for man, but not for God, but not for God. Jesus here explains the possibility of the possible, or excuse me, the impossible for us. Here we discover what Jesus plans to get a fat camel through the eye of a tiny needle. Here, he's going to explain to us and answer how sinful human beings can be able to enter into the kingdom. In verses, or excuse me, look over in chapter 20. We'll read verses 18 and 19. Jesus says, Behold, 
we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge, and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. There it is. That's it. That's the answer. Jesus suffers. Jesus dies. Jesus rises again. And looking upon the Holy One, as we prepare ourselves even for the upcoming Holy Week, we trust in Him as little children, trust in their parents for bread and for clothing and for shelter and for everything in life. We look to Jesus. Jesus, the one who suffered. Jesus, the one who died. Jesus, the one who rose again. And we believe, and that is the way. It's the only way. If I were to take you back to the introduction to this message, where I told you about the story of the little girl that got her head stuck in the bars, this didn't bring it all together. Is how it all makes sense. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is similar to those police with their battering ram. They, there is a free gift that is coming for that little girl, and there's a free gift that came for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that little girl knew she was stuck. And she had a choice to make. She could call out for help, or she could just keep trying to solve her own big-headed problem. But big-headed people can't get themselves out of big-headed problems. But calling for help would require something. Faith and trust that the people she called were willing and able to get her out of that dilemma. Many people here are faced with a decision, whether to call or to not to call upon Jesus Christ, whether to believe or not believe. Many people here may be in grave danger because their head is stuck and it's too big to squeeze through the door to the kingdom of heaven. We've all sinned foolishly. And the only way to be freed from the calamity of our own big headedness is to call out to Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to free us and others from the prison, from the bars of this encapsulating sin. And only he can. The only question that remains is, will you call upon him to free you from your big-headed problem that's staring you right in the face? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what Jesus wants. For us, the impossible becomes possible when we have childlike faith. And for those of us who are saved, it manifests itself in a daily dependence by calling out to Christ and seeking his aid. That's the kind of faith Peter expresses. Interestingly enough, in verse number 27, where we read, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have there for? Peter's basically saying, see, look, we've, we've left everything. We've followed you. What, what else? I mean, what else is there to do? And what, 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 what will we have? Now, we've gotten a little too used to Peter at this point, right? We just think, oh, this is another thoughtless blunder. This, Peter's opened his big mouth again, his big fat mouth, and then he stuck his foot in it. But I, I don't think that's the case here. I, think, I don't think Peter's missed the point at all. I think he's actually being sincere and genuine, and I think... He really is legitimately asking a real question because they really did leave their family for a period of time. And they really did forsake their brothers and their sisters and their spouses and their lands and their house. They, they left it all to follow Jesus. And I think by our Lord's response in verses 28 through 30, we see that Jesus sees that Peter's reply isn't childish at all. In fact, it's childlike the exact point that Jesus is trying to make. We read again here in verse number 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, that is, the, the new world, with the new heavens and the new earth, by the way, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye, sh ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold in this life, of course, perhaps, definitely in the next life, and shall inherit everlasting life. By the way, that's what the rich young ruler was after. Now, listen, 
but many that are first, like the rich man, shall be last. And the last, like Peter, shall be first. Now, if you were to look up in an old, old dictionary, an early edition of Webster's Dictionary, and look up the word Christian, this is what you would find, as defined, a decent, civilized, or presentable person. Now, the rich man would certainly fall into that category, wouldn't he? But does he really meet the definition? A better definition comes from the Random House Dictionary, and it says this, a Christian is someone who exhibits a spirit proper to a follower of Jesus Christ, as in having a loving regard for other persons. And that's a bit more accurate, but also incomplete. Let's take this from our text, our definition, summation of Jesus' teachings here, and say this, a Christian is simply someone who is last, who places Jesus first, someone who is humble, trusting, and trusting enough to subordinate all other allegiances to their allegiance to Jesus Christ. A Christian is someone who's last, so they can place Jesus first. That's what a Christian is. Let me finish with one story, a story within a story within a story. About 15 years ago now, my wife and I met a young lady by the name of Angelique. And she was about our age at the time. And she was especially, especially interested in the gospel and in church. But she was, she was not a Christian. She, uh, uh, she, she, didn't, she didn't know anything about Jesus or the gospel. But for whatever reason, she was really excited to find out more. And it's very rare to meet people like this. And so we worked with her about finding a time to come to church. And as her schedule would allow, she was able to come on Wednesday. Now, I love Wednesday midweek services, but they are not really evangelistic. <laughs> and this was no exception. In fact, our associate pastor, uh, Pastor Tommy Thompson, uh, what a name. He was there preaching on the great evangelistic message of financial stewardship. And I'm sitting there as um, perplexed as I am going, God, she comes. She needs to be saved. And, and we're, we're preaching on financial stewardship? It's, it's an unsanctified, you've got to be kidding me moment. It's a moment where I'm going, certainly, God, I know what this woman needs to hear. And you know, if you just hop off the throne for a few minutes, I can take it from here. I got it. And so I sat there, not hearing a word about financial stewardship, and the Holy Spirit was working on her spirit while I was working on my nerves. And I kid you not, I kid you not, we get through that service, and she looks over at me, and she says, Joe, I'm a rich kid. I grew up with money. And I got to tell you, I've been trusting in money all my life. And it's at that moment that my mouth begins to drop. And I'm going... Okay, you, you never got off the throne. It's okay. I'm just going to listen to the rest of what this lady has to say. She says, Joe, I've been, trusting in, I've been trusting in money my whole life. And the Spirit just revealed that to me during this message. And it, my mouth just gets wider. And she says, I, I think I need to be saved. And as soon as I swallowed my pride, I could shut my mouth. And I said, well, something spiritual. Amen. That. Let's go do this. Oh my goodness, what just happened? Yeah, let's go, let's go, Wandalee. Come on, let's go. And man, glory to God, she got saved. Despite my greatest plans. <laughs> she realized she was trusted in money. And that trust was keeping her out of the kingdom. And the Holy Spirit was working, unlike any way that I could ever work. Rarely have I ever seen someone so enthusiastically accept Jesus Christ. And then like another person who was obsessed with money in the scripture, Matthew, hmm, oh look, the gospel of Matthew, went back and had a party at her house and invited all the sinners she knew and invited Lisa and I over to go share the gospel with those people so they could be saved too. Money obsessed people can find a way into the kingdom. It's impossible for us. But God, through the Spirit and through His Scriptures, 
will prick a person's heart to show them there's only one way into the kingdom, honey. And that's through Jesus. Shrink that head. I don't know what's going on in your heart. I don't know what you're really trusting in. But as the Lord directs you, are you really willing to give your life to the riches of this fleeting and dying world for a chance to enjoy the creature comforts that will pass away one day? It's all vanity. What will you give in this world's goods that's worth your own soul? Are you willing to turn away from that and trust Jesus Christ, who is the true riches and extends to you the greatest gift that costs no money to us, but is only through the precious blood of Jesus Christ? Will you take that? Will you take that gift? And listen, friends, if you've received that gift, which has cost you nothing, will you trample over it, living in the comfort of pompish, pomp lifestyles when you see others who have need, who need your help, who need to know that you're not living high on the hog just so you can have a lavish lifestyle to the glory of God when there are people that are perishing as we kick up our feet in lavish lifestyles. That's not what God saved us for. He saved us to be poor in spirit and to be poor in possessions, to mobilize us to share the gospel, to open wide the door to the kingdom, to show big-headed people how they can get in. Are you involved in that mission? We need you. Stay on the path. Walk with God. Stay small. Stay childlike. And God will use you. So we all stand to our feet. If you're stuck, let God get you unstuck. The piano will play, and I invite you into this moment of reflection to ask the Lord to make your head small, to demonstrate childlike faith, and to walk with God right into the kingdom. As the piano plays, I invite you to come. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, will you come today? I want to help you. I want to help you know the Lord and the way of salvation. You can meet with me afterwards. You can come talk to me now. But please, please come. Christians, friends, walk with God. The smallness of childlike faith. Trust Him. Don't look to this world's riches. Don't rest your security on the passing comforts of this world. But look to Jesus Christ as your own security. And know that He is able to do everything you need Him to do. And seek first the kingdom. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for truth and mercy. Father, I pray that you'll help us to remain humble in your sight, to see ourselves as you see us, both beloved and in need of your grace. Father, I pray that you'll bless us and continue to help us walk with you today and to open our hearts to your truth as we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Just a couple of announcements today. So our MOVE meeting, our monthly outreach visitation um, uh, meeting, is taking place 
basically immediately after church around 12:30 or so and this will be a brief meeting I, I honestly mean that I'm uh, there to just give you brief instructions and to equip you with some things and um, and uh, direct you uh, accordingly and we'll get you we'll get you moving right out the door so that way you can continue fellowshipping with one another but that's today uh, we're gonna meet here in the sanctuary so if you want to hang out here while I get uh, while I get our materials you can come and uh, we'll take care of that also this Friday uh, April 1st, is a blood drive and um uh, if we could have uh, hopefully i know many people here have signed up to donate blood and we're gonna have quite a few people but we need a volunteer to help my wife usually i'm here um i will be uh departing this tuesday to go to california on a mission trip with six other people from our church so if you'll pray for that as well but lisa will be here running uh running the show uh for the blood drive uh signing getting people signed in and run through and if you have some availability that day uh, the uh, the hours of the blood drive go from three till seven in any segment of that. You don't have to stay the whole time, but if you have some availability during the day, that would help her out. Things go much, much better with two people than they do with one. And so we would appreciate that. You can come see me or Lisa if you need some details on that. And then start thinking about the Easter holiday coming up. We'll have the Lord's Supper during Holy Week and we'll think about and we'll have uh, Easter Sunday. Start thinking about who you can invite, things that we'll do and some uh, special things that are going on there. And uh, just two more things. The Young Adults Life Group is going to be meeting on the 23rd of April. So the previously announced date, uh, which I'm not going to repeat, that way you don't get confused, are not happening. So, uh, But it will take place on the 23rd. And, um, and so if you have any more questions, you can see Matt or Steph about that. And then tonight, come back tonight, we're going to have a special blessing. Tom Inman is uh, uh, one of our men here and a former pastor, and he's going to be uh, starting kind of a three-part series through Romans chapter 8, something that he's asked if, uh, if he could do, and I'm excited to hear that. And so we'll hear part one tonight uh, about that. And I believe that's everything. We're good. OK, fantastic. Let's pray. Thank you for coming today. I, I appreciate your faithfulness. I appreciate your love for the Lord and your desire to worship with other believers and for being here with us today. So thank you very much for coming. We enjoy having you here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for truth. And Lord, we don't ever want to take for granted your sacred book that you've given to us. Father, thank you for giving us an understanding of it. Help us to walk with you in humility. Help us to glorify you. Bless us with rest as we go our way today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.